Tell us, first of all, why you're being open about your diagnosis. Well, I, it sort of crept up on me in a way. I, I think partly um, within my family and amongst my very close friends and associates, I decided quite early on, it took me about 12 microseconds to decide that I would tell them all, including my children, where it was at. You have three grown-up sons. I've got three, yeah, well, they're 19, 21, 24. Mm. So, um, and I think my experience of that has been that telling them, even things that are very difficult and very difficult to deal with, m to be honest, more difficult for them than for me, mm. <laughs> I found. I mean, I found when I got the original diagnosis, when it, when it was clear that it was kind of pretty serious, I, I uh, the doctors and the nurses were all very helpful, and, and their, their manner sort of, there was an expectation, I think, that I would sort of collapse in a heap. And not only did I not do that, um, I felt strangely unaffected by it. Partly, I think, because I sort of worked it out. I mean, right from the very beginning, I'd Googled my, once I knew my symptoms mm -hmm. and with anemia, which is the thing that really kicked it off. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you do my vague symptoms, a bit of fullness, a bit of this, and a bit of anemia, when you do that, you only get one result, <laughs> really. So I think quite early on, I, for myself, I kind of worked it out. And I just thought, honestly, oh, well, you know, my luck's run out. I've had a pretty lucky life. I've done lots of things that a lot of people don't get a chance to do. I've been a, a journalist. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it keeps you, it's a keep you alive kind of job because you're always looking at new things and nothing I've ever looked at has ever turned out to be boring. And to cut a long story short, uh, by the time it gets to the sort of serious end of the diagnosis, I don't mean I'm unaffected by it. And I do get these moments where, you know, I just well up. Yeah. It could happen any minute. <laughs> it happens quite unpredictably. Mm. Uh, you may have gone through this yourself. It happens quite unpredictably. It's just a look in the mirror or a shower or this or that or something happens and you just get this, you get a thought and you can't get rid of it and it just makes you sort of want to cry. Mm. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to suggest I'm unaffected by it. No. But telling them, uh, really I found, really um, it empowered them actually. And it meant that they were, they were then, they felt part of it. That sort of led me, I think, to, to, to wondering about whether people really talked about cancer enough. I mean, in some respects, you know, you can listen to Radio 4, and if, and if you listen to a lot of Radio 4, you know, quite a lot of it's about cancer, <laughs> funnily enough. But it tends not to be men talking about it. Mm. And I don't mean people are sort of closed about their feelings about it, but it tends, it, it doesn't, there's something about what we've done with PM which appears to have touched something of a nerve. Yeah. And I can only speculate as, uh, as to kind of why that is. But I sort of thought there's not enough said about cancer, often enough. Mm. Um, and, and particularly it, about incurable cancer. Well, and it, rem it remains this kind of you know, taboo. As Absolutely. If, but one, of my, one of my kids actually on, on uh, PM last night, you know, said, I, was, I thought it was really profound. He said, and it sort of encapsulates what I sort of feel about it. He said, you know, you, you, there are two ways you can deal with it effectively. You, you can become depressed, you can become, as it were, you can become the victim. Of course, you are a victim. Mm. Uh, you can, and you can waste with the with this negativity. Mm. You can waste all the time you've got left. And of course, in my case, no one knows how long I've got left. If you look at the statistics, it's not great. Mm. If you look at the potential, but they are statistics. So you know, are you in the forty percent, or are you in the sixty yeah. percent, are you in the two percent, or the four percent? Depending on where you end up putting yourself, or where you end up, where you end up, actually, you know, it could be. I could have months, years, or even a normal lifespan. Mm. To be honest, that's in the outer reaches of probabilities. Yeah. <laughs> Not something you put next week's wages on, I don't think. But, you know, it, who knows? But is that uncertainty of not knowing weighing on you, or are you just cracking on? Well, I'm just... I, is it weighing on me? Well, I'm aware of it. But it, it, it's a bit of a truism this year. People say, live life to the full, live every day as it comes. Mm. And people say that in general. Yes. There's, there's something about the sort of life I'm living, living now which isn't really any different in principle to the life we all lead. <laughs> could get knocked over by a bus, could lose your job, you know, could, could get hit with a sort of terminal disease. We all know this rationally mm. and of course we mostly spend a lot of our time in dealing with things that, you know, if, to be responsible, to have a proper grown-up life, you have to deal with things which are difficult and all the rest of it. So it, it's a very interesting, it's a very neat injunction to say, well, live life to its full, take every day as it comes, you know, make them of all the time you've got. And I think in normal life, people say it, but rarely do it. Yes. When you've been given notice, and I feel as if I've been given notice, I, I don't know, I'm part of some sort of, you know, sort of universal kind of redundancy exercise. I don't know whether I'm going to get picked or not, mm. but I'm definitely in the pool for selection, <laughs> is how I'd put it. Yeah. And it does change the way you think. 
it changes the way. For example, when it's happened to, when it, it will have happened to many of your viewers, when you're in danger of losing your job and you're put into the redundancy pool, just, just how does that make you think about what's going to happen next and the rest of it? So in a way, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next. You know, the, strictly speaking, the outlook is not fantastically positive, but that doesn't mean there aren't lots of chances that it could be a lot better than that. We have stomach in the esophagus, so it's down here, as mm. it were. Um, first symptoms, I just felt a little bit full. Sometimes when I was, just when I'd eaten half a banana or half a sandwich or half a pint of beer or something, not, not, not in pain, not like indigestion, but just a bit sort of, a bit full. And every now and again, I'd eat something, and if I ate it too quickly, it would feel like it was getting stuck, not in my throat, but in the back of my chest. Right. And the best example, the, best, the, the, the feeling I remember best about it was, um, as a kid, drinking fizzy pop, if you drank too much fizzy pop in a big gulp, you'd feel it in your back, or mm. well, certainly I did. And that's the sort of feeling. So it was a lot, I just simply dismissed it as eating things too quickly and whatever. I actually went on holiday to Vietnam, where I did quite a lot of relaxing, ate a lot of noodles, and it all went away. And right. I thought, oh, there's the answer, relax and eat noodles. <laughs> Came back, and of course, the symptoms returned. Yeah. And it was actually in a, a Wagamama's. Nothing, but the, nothing wrong with Wagamama's no, food. No. No, no, really, it was, it was nothing wrong with them at all. Mm. I got about two thirds of the way through this meal with, with the kids, actually. I call them kids, the men. Mm. Um, and I felt something get stuck. And this time I started salivating because what your body's trying to do is it's trying to get the food, get the food to pass. So I started salivating and I didn't feel at all sick and I could breathe all right. But anyway, I couldn't, there was nowhere to spit it out. I couldn't swallow it because I was filling up. So I had to go outside. It was actually snowing, I can remember it. And I was standing outside sort of spitting and eventually retching. Mm. And the, the, in the end, the kids said, right, that's it, doctors. I went to doctor on the Monday and to get a long story short, the NHS were absolutely astonishing. Mm. Within two weeks, I'd gone from first visit to GP, blood transfusions because I was so anemic, endoscopies, both ends, gastroscopy and colonoscopy, uh, which gave us a preliminary diagnosis, CT scan, which showed that it was it had spread and all the rest of it was stage four. And you know, so within two weeks, I knew pretty well where I was. You began having chemo and you kept your hair. Yeah. I hate you. The cold cap. Yes. Um, <laughs> but after several sessions, after several sessions, it was, it was, well, after, it seemed to be okay, working. After four, it seemed to be having okay, an effect. So what's happening was, I, I started with the chemotherapy. First of all, I was very lucky in that I didn't have those things. I've read people have written about this, and I can, I've seen it happen to people. You know, I didn't have to kind of retreat to a darkened room for 24 hours or 48 hours. I didn't get any nausea or vomiting. Mm. I, I, I got, I mean, I got some other. I got a bit of constipation, if you really want to know. Mm. And also, as time went on, I got this thing called Palmer Plantar Syndrome, where your hands and feet become very, very red. Actually, it makes it quite hard to walk sometimes. Right. So you then end up sort of walking on the sides of your feet like that, and then yeah. your ankles swell up, then you can't move at all. Yeah. So, that, that, to be honest, that was the most significant side effect. Right. Of course, a few days with the chemo, the chemicals, the steroids, it's all very, you know, a bit weird. And mm. it, you know, I felt a bit like I had a hangover yeah. for about 10 days, but I really was not, I was not significantly affected, which, you know, which, as I say, I think was lucky. The other thing was, I started feeling, for, when I wasn't feeling chemicaled, I started feeling quite quickly better than I felt before I knew I was ill. I have more. I still, actually, I still do. I have more energy. I'm more on it. I, you know, I'm, I'm more. I'm more in tune. I, I didn't realise I was ill, but with hindsight, yeah. it was. I wasn't right. Mm. Anyway, um, so it was all looking rather good. The original plan was to do six cycles of chemotherapy, 21-day cycles, with a scan after three to see what was happening. The consultant then said, "Look, she would. She's very conservative, and this is all good." You know, she wouldn't say, I think this is working, but right. I sort of detected a bit of a glint in her eye and I thought she, she probably thought it was working. So she said, OK, let's delay the scan to four cycles mm -hmm. and if, we can, if you're tolerating it, let's go for eight. Uh, so we scan after four and what, it's amazing. The main tumour has shrunk. Wow. The metastases in the lymph nodes have reduced in number and reduced in size by half. The liver, they're disappearing like bilio, these metastases, mm -hmm. these lesions. And there's a big one they're measuring, and it's reduced in size by two thirds. Wow! So, no, so this is kind of they call it a partial response, right? Which is a very conservative medical. But I was, everyone was thrilled. You, know, you think yeah. amazing, it's working. So that was a real up. Yeah. You know? So we think we're pressing on with eight cycles and mm -hmm. so on and so on. And it does become a bit more tiring as it goes on, but nevertheless, eight cycles off we go. After the seventh cycle, I was getting a little bit of a, a bit of feeling in my esophagus. I was sort of okay, this wasn't great, the palmar plantar syndrome. And the consultant said, well, look, 
we don't need, there's nothing in the books if you have to do eight cycles, mm -hmm. you know. So why don't we just scan now? And if it's all okay, then we can move on to the next stage, you know, whatever. So we scanned after seven that day. I went back to see her that afternoon and she was, to say she was ashen faced is not the right word. Right much, much, much more upset than I was mm. uh, to, to discover that the chemo had simply stopped working completely and that uh, we were back to where we started from. So the main tumour had grown, it was active again the liver and the lymph nodes. And so it really was kind of, mm. what do you now do now, sort of start again time. Mm. I mean, in fairness, they, they expect, at some point they expect chemo to kind of run out on you. It's certainly in my position. I don't mean if it's pre-surgical or it's, you know, and you're, it's a, if there are curative options, then this is different. Yeah. The, in the palliative arena, for most people, the, that line of chemo eventually fails, mm. eventually. But it's a bit unlucky to have it fail while you're still on the treatment. It, it, <laughs> although, it really is. Although, although, you know, look at it this way, I've had three or four months, mm. you know, of time feeling pretty good, to be honest, yeah. as a result of the chemo when it was working. If that had never happened, I don't know if we'd be having this conversation. Fair enough. How how are your boys? Well, they're fine. I, mean, I heard them you. on the radio last night. One of them sounds absolutely just like you. <laughs> I couldn't work out which one it which was. One was. The one who's talking about going to the pub all the time. Probably. Could could have been him. No, well, they're, well, they're fine. They're, so Freddie, the eldest one, he's uh, a musician by background. He mm. did music at Manchester and did pretty well. And then he got a, a scholarship at the Royal Academy to study the tuba uh, for two years. Uh, he got a position with the St Petersburg Ballet, and uh, now he works in advertising. Oh, which is okay. Celery. Anyway, so he's, he's having a he's having a fine time. He lives in London. Uh, Billy's in the middle ones in the final year of politics, philosophy, and economics at Manchester. This is weird, by the way. I went to Manchester in 1977. Mm. And for some reason, two of mine, extra years later, both gone to Manchester. Anyway, he's doing politics, philosophy, and economics, and he's his final year this year. Bertie, the young, youngest one, who is also the biggest and the tallest, he's just started Nottingham Trend doing film and philosophy. Mm. So they're fine. I mean, it was interesting hearing them talk on with Eddie Mayer last night. Mm. Um, first of all, I think they all, they appreciated knowing and being told. Billy says something really interesting, the middle one, because he was away for a lot of it. Yes. So he was getting it on the phone. He yeah. wasn't in the room, you know. He wasn't there. He said that knowing meant that the, his kind of friendship group were able to come around and support him at college. Yeah. And that's because he knew. If, if, if he hadn't felt he could be open about it, mm. then that wouldn't have happened. But he was kind of really surprised with how supportive Everybody his sort of friendship group was. Because, yeah. you know, as you know yourself personally, and, you know, the figure was well, one in three of us will get affected by cancer at some point. And mm. Cancer Research UK now reckon it's one in two. In fairness, that's partly because it's an ageing population. So yes. it's not there's an increasing incidence of it. There is more cancer because people are living longer, so it's more time to have. You are hoping to get involved in some clinical trials. Well, I'm, I'm approaching the point where that that's becomes a sort of a significant option. Mm. Um, and if that previous round of chemo, if that previous first line of chemo hadn't failed, there were a couple of trials that I could have potentially gone and got involved in. Um, so I, my gene genetics are being tested for various things which might lead to some novel treatments which work on people with particular ver genetic variations. Mm. One they test for, interestingly, with my cancer is the HER2 gene, which, yeah. is the breast, which is the breast yeah, cancer yeah. gene, and the, the Herceptin controversy mm. as it was. You know, if people have her, if they overexpress HER2, then Herceptin is an extraordinarily effective treatment. If they don't overexpress HER2, it's about as much use as a chocolate teapot. Yeah. <laughs> so it's similar in my cancer. HER2, if it's overexpressed, there's another other line of treatment. I don't over, unfortunately, I don't overexpress HER2. Right. But the point, the point now, so it, it's a bit, it's a bit of a conundrum. This now, or a bit of a, it's a bit of a like a maze. So I, the next, I'm now on radiotherapy mm -hmm. for 12 days, high dose, to reduce, to give control of the main tumour. This will not have any effect on the liver and the lymph nodes, but it should produce some shrinkage in the main tumour. So they're blasting it to bits with very high, high dose X-rays, mm -hmm. um, which is leaving me feeling a bit sort of yucky. But it's, I mean, to be honest, it's all perfectly livable with. Yeah. Um, after that, um, they then, then, then the options are, we, there are, chemical, there are clinical trials coming up which I have to wait at least four weeks to participate in because they insist that you finish one line of treatment mm. and there's a washout period. Obviously, the trial's not much use if what they're measuring inadvertently is what the last treatment did. Yeah, that <laughs> so makes you, sense. So you yeah. have to wait time. Yeah. So the question then for me is, is the disease in my liver inactive enough 
to mean that we can afford to wait four or six weeks for these various trials to become available. If it's active, and you know, if it was, if it's still progressing, and mm. progressing in this term, in these terms, as you all know, is not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> if it's progressing, then I have to start second line chemotherapy immediately. When will you know the answer to that? Next, I should know next Tuesday. Right. So I scan next Monday, consult it next Tuesday. I should know next Tuesday. Um, at which point something else happens. So if I have to start chemo immediately, it's paclitaxel, which is fine. There's another drug which can go with paclitaxel, mm. which produces a really significant improvement in response rates. But to cut a long story short, uh, it's licensed and proven to be effective, but NICE won't fund it. OK, well, we've heard that before, haven't we? Indeed, we have. Goodness so me. I might be in a position of having to sort of cash in a pension here or there to try and pay for it. Right, which you would obviously do. I think, I've, well, if, if that's the option that the yeah. consultant says there's the one, I think, yes, I'll do it. Yes. Uh, right, Roy is watching you. Uh, he emails, I have also been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Mine is cancer of the bone marrow. It's as if that's me on screen. Uh, sometimes I wish it was all over because I am afraid of the end game. Uh, my treatment seems that it's not working anymore. Uh, Arnold asks this, how can you be so positive and so normal? With deal when dealing with such a diagnosis? Well, I think I'll go back to what Billy said on PM last night, the middle one. I, I kind of think, why not? I mean, yeah. I, I th I don't, I'm, not reconciled, I'm not reconciled to the process of the end. Mm. But I think I am reconciled to the fact that the end might not be that far away. Mm. So the process, of course, scares me, as I'm sure it scares everybody who has to contemplate it. But in the meantime, while I feel like this, while I can be active, while I can go out, see friends, go for meals, watch films, even travel abroad, a bit of an insurance gamble on that front, because you try as you might, you can't get it, yeah, or I couldn't yeah. get it. But anyway, you know, while I can do these things, I kind of think, well, why, why just sit at home and wait for the inevitable, you know, or, or even regard it like that? So I feel, the other thing is, I go back to the beginning, I am a journalist through and through, I think, and so I'm always asking questions. And I suppose I'm treating this a bit like, it's a bit like a sort of project, yeah. <laughs> in a way. So, and that, that, perhaps that sort of changes one's perspective on it. But I think fundamentally, it isn't that different from normal life. It's just that the timescales are different and, the, and you know, you, you have to accept that, that they say, you're on notice. Mm. But what, what is the point of, I, I sort of feel, and okay, if, I, if I felt really rotten, if the chemotherapy had been really hard to, to, to tolerate and I'd been, you know, chained to the lavatory or locked away in a room for our days on end I might be having I might be feeling rather different about it yes but I fortunately I wasn't so I don't I don't feel particular I don't feel ill I don't feel quite right mm. but I wouldn't say that I felt ill I've certainly felt iller in the past mm. with man flu and one thing or another so I can think well sort of why wouldn't you and, and actually my observation would be that if you can strike the right frame of mind it doesn't half help mm. <laughs> Eric I felt like everyone around you, actually. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Eric says, I'm not a regular Radio 4 listener. I wasn't aware that Steve Hewlett was ill with cancer, a fine journalist, and I admire his uh, positivity. And that's, that's, you know, represented by so many tweets and uh, texts. And you will have heard this before, email from Phil. How brave is he? Well, let's see, there's an odd one. Funny word. I've had lots and lots and lots of stuff. Mm. I mean, I've put on over a 1,000 Twitter followers. The reaction to the PM stuff has been mm. just... Well, more than I'd ever imagined and ever bargained for. And I think, I think we've touched a bit of a nerve. I think what it's... So, I, I take it as evidence that people don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. I was actually contacted by someone who I know, I won't go into the precise details, uh, who had a very close relative, a man, uh, who died, um, unfortunately, in about six months from diagnosis to, mm. to his end. And um, they sort of said that they'd appreciated the interviews I'd done with PM because it, it gave them a clue as to what their relative might have been thinking. And the idea that you could go from six months to popping off without ever really discussing it, I wonder how common that is. Yeah. I wonder. So... Uh, uh, the only th insight I've got into that is when I had to have a wig made, or when I wanted to have yeah. a wig made, because I lost loads of my hair, the lady who made the wig for me said she deals with a lot of women uh, who don't tell anyone not even their partners, that they have cancer. Yeah. And I found that astonishing. I understand it. No, I don't understand it. I, I, I heard, heard what she was telling me. I didn't understand it. I just, I just thought, 
that I don't know if well, that's no, I, 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 it, it comes as a big surprise to me too yeah. that people people don't talk about it. Even, I mean, not necessarily broadcast it. This is this is different. But yeah. Amongst their friends and family yeah. and close and close friends, that people will, will withhold it. Mm. But I think that's why the PM thing has hit such a nerve, mm. because vast numbers of people. I mean, it, I, I don't know how many thousands have been in touch, but it's quite a lot. Yeah. You know, uh, are really appear to be really grateful, and I sort of, I sort of, are find themselves drawn to this conversation, which is a conversation that they've either wanted to have but haven't had, maybe think they should have had, know people who they wished had had it. <laughs> it. It's becoming a bit of a thing, I think. Just to go back to where it started, though, on the bravery front, I don't feel remotely brave. Honestly, I don't. I, I'm not doing this out of a sense of kind of. You know, fight the good fight. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not even sure I even feel as if I'm at war with anything. I don't. No. It didn't. It doesn't feel like. I know this, it's a bit of an alien, but it's me. Mm. <laughs> I don't. I don't feel that I'm. I don't. I don't even feel that I'm battling something. I don't. No. That's not. But in terms of the on the bravery front, I don't feel brave. I feel privileged in a way to be able to talk about it, mm. and to get the kind of response I've got. I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't anticipating. It isn't why I did it. But I tell you, you, you get thousands of people writing, emailing, tweeting. And all the rest of it in the terms in which they do, and it doesn't all give you a lift.